Bonjour. Morgan. Konnichiwa. Hello. Uh, my name is Richard, uh, and I'm here to talk about pragmatic functional refactoring with Java 8, uh, which was a talk I wrote with my uh, friend and colleague, Raul, who I run training courses with. So if you see this Raul guy on a couple of slides, then that's who he is. So pragmatic functional refactoring is a title that's got quite a few kind of buzzwordy things in, right? Pragmatic, functional, refactoring, Java 8, still relatively new in some organizations. So what's it really all about? Well, for many people, functional programming is something which this guy does. So this guy is an academic. You can tell he's an academic because he looks really sad. He's not very happy with things. He's got a massive bushy beard loads of long hair, um, and yet many programmers don't look like this academic guy. Many programmers, well, okay, maybe not made of Lego, but you know, uh, want to get on with their day job, they want to be productive, they want to achieve the business goals they've got in front of them. So this talk is kind of about how you can take some ideas from the functional programming world, from perhaps it's a bit more weirdy beardy and academic, and bring them into your business and get some good productivity benefits, how you can write better, more reliable software faster. So to this end, I'm going to talk about four kind of different key concepts, bring ideas in from functional programming, and focus not so much on the concept itself, but more how you can use them. So I'm going to talk about first class functions, currying, immutability, and the optional data type. So don't worry if you don't know what these terms mean, you will do by the end of the talk. So, let's suppose you run, say, a small business, and you've done the almost impossible. You've signed up Oracle as a customer, and that means that they're going to pay you money rather than you paying them money, which would be fantastic, right? So, uh, and your boss comes in and says, look, I want to report, and I want to see all the invoices that are from Oracle. Well, you might write some code in kind of Java, legacy Java, that looks a bit like this. You're taking your list with all your invoices in, you'll get a result list, you'll loop over your input, and you'll say, is the customer Oracle? If so, I'll add it to my result list. Nice and simple, right? Hands up who's written some code that looks something like this at some point in time. Pretty much everyone. But, you know, your boss comes back and says, Oh, just one more thing, we just want one more slight requirement change. What about if we had a report that had different customers? Maybe you've got Oracle, maybe you've got other companies who are your customers, and you want to see filtering by that different customer. So again, a very, very standard thing that we might do, which is abstracting that customer. So making the customer a parameter of the method, and as opposed to having the hard-coded Oracle sitting in the middle of the loop, we have the customer. Again, very, very basic, simple code, but you know, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. So your boss kind of comes along and says, hey, just Richard, just, just one more thing, another little requirement change, just one more requirement change. What if we want to say, pull in invoices with different things in the title? Like maybe they'll say training, maybe they'll say consulting, maybe they'll say development, all sorts of different things that your business might do. Well, you might well have a different parameter in here called, which we've called suffix, which will check the name of the invoice has. So you could say, does it end with training? Does it end with consulting? You, you, can, you could filter by those different things. And what we've done in order to write this method is we've basically copied and pasted nearly the entirety of the previous uh, slide's worth of code, and just change that one little line, okay? Who's happy with this? I'm not happy with this. Thankfully, no one's hand went up. So, periodically, you get some really, really enthusiastic developer who says, I'm not paid by the number of lines of code. How can I get these two methods into one thing? And sometimes people come up with all sorts of creative and awful ideas, such as this, for example, where you might have, say, a flag that swaps between the customer and the suffix, 
And if the flag's true, it checks the customer. If it's false, it checks the suffix. Who likes this code? No one. What's wrong with this kind of code? Anyone? Readability, yeah, it's, it's terrible to read. It's kind of conflating two different concerns in this one method. It's still not flexible enough, right? What if you want your training invoices from Oracle or something, some combination of, of, of the two criteria? It's a bit messy. You don't want to do this. this. This sucks, okay? So let's just take a step back and think what other alternatives we can do in Java code before Java 8. Well, we could apply the, basically the strategy design pattern here, couldn't we? We could have an interface that models that filtering criteria, which we're going to call a predicate. And it's a function. It's just, just a single method on that interface, really. And it says, take some type, like our invoice, and return true or false. So whether we want to retain it in that list or not. We could refactor our code here. Now, what we've done is we've replaced some specific value with the predicate, and we've replaced some specific logic here with just the method call on that predicate. So instead of abstracting by a value, like the customer's name or the suffix or something, we've abstracted over a filtering criteria, over some behavior, and we could implement that behavior. You know, even before Java 8 came along, we could implement that behavior with a class, right? We could say, hey, here's a predicate that says, is the customer Facebook and is it training? But the reality is that even though that's a lot more flexible than the previous approach, it's very, very rare that people actually go ahead and do this kind of thing. You'll see all over applications, this kind of copy and paste standard boilerplate with a for loop and an if statement. It's kind of everywhere. It's so common that people often don't even recognize it as being boilerplate code. And part of that is because if we rewrote it to be this way, it would still be very boilerplate right? We just want to say, is the customer Facebook, and does the name of the invoice end with training? And what we've actually had to do here is say, hey, class Facebook training implements predicative interface, blah, 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 all this unnecessary clutter. So it's still really hard to read because of this clutter. It doesn't say what it does. What it does is just those two lines there. So one of the features that Java 8 introduces that lets us help solve this problem is method references. So a method reference is a way of saying, take this method and that interface there, which had a single abstract method on that interface, use this method as the implementation for the method on that functional interface. Okay. So we have, say, is Oracle invoice as a method here, or is training invoice, and we can just pass in a method reference to say, use this method here, use this method here. Another feature we have with Java 8 is Lambda expressions. Fantastic. And Lambda expressions let us write an implementation of that functional interface. There are, it's basically just saying, here's a function, it's anonymous, we'll write it in line. Nice and simple. So we take the invoice, we get the customer out, we check the customer's oracle, or we check the name ends with training. So let's step back a little bit here and see what we've really done. We've really used a concept called first class functions. And whenever you see programming language people talk about something as being, hey, it's a first class citizen. It's amazing, it, you know, they're trying to associate it with Really nice train journeys, really expensive, lie back seats in planes. What they really mean is it's part of the language. There's some useful thing for it built in. It's actually something which you've been able to do in object oriented programming for years and years and years by the use of the pattern known as the function object. It's kind of the same thing, but a lot more verbose, a lot more boilerplate. -y. So in practice, we don't get the benefits of that flexibility is you still end up with lots of boilerplate code before you had lambdas and method references. Now you've got lambdas and the method references, you can just pass in a function like a value. You can treat it like a value here. And we've shown how we can use it here to help cope with requirement changes. So every time your boss or your BA or someone comes up to you and says, Richard, I just want to make this one little slight change in your code that can also become 
one little slight change rather than copy and paste and boilerplate and all sorts of bigger changes. We can extend this. Now we've got first class functions, we can extend this a little bit. So when you're a child, who likes playing with Lego? Fantastic, fantastic. I don't know if it's just me, but I often feel that there's a really, really big predictor of people becoming software developers if they played with Lego as a kid. Loads of people love Lego. And the thing with Lego that's great is you've got all these simple little bits that individually have kind of a lot of regularity and nothing individual about them, like these guys here. And you can use them to create beautiful artistic structures like the horse on the right hand side. Uh, by putting them together, by composing them. And we can do the same thing with functions. We can take little single functions that had single purposes, and we can put them together to build more complicated, useful functionality without complicating the code. So how does that work? Well, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to say, hey, here's a, a criteria for a customer, like is it an invoice related to Facebook or something? And is it a training invoice? So we want to be able to build up kind of queries like this. Or we could say something like, is it a Facebook or is it a Google invoice? So what we've done here is we've assigned a method reference to this predicate, and we've got these and and these all things. These, these are methods on that functional interface that create you a new function. That's function composition. So how does this work? Well, uh, with code that looks very, very much like this Java standard library, but was definitely not copied from the standard library, we can see what's going on under the hood. Well, our predicate interface had a method on called test, but Java 8 also introduces the ability to have default methods on interfaces. So these are methods on interfaces that have implementation of bodies. And there are two default methods here. There's an and and an or. And what it really does is it takes another predicate as its argument, checks it's not null, and returns us a new function by way, of, by way of a lambda that says, call myself, and if it's true, call this other guy. And the same thing with the or. So we get a new function, we've composed to get this new function, but it's all in the library, it's all there for us, it's nice and simple. And this means we can build really rich things. Another way we can compose functions is by putting together function pipelines. So suppose we've got an email here, and our email's got a message, and we can add a header, or check the spelling, or the, you know, add the signature. But we might want to compose these things in different and flexible ways. So maybe we want to add the header, and check the spelling, and add the signature. Or maybe we don't care about the spelling. Maybe we're sending it to someone informal in our company who knows that FTW means for the win. And we can just add the header and add the signature. So we want to be able to have a pipeline that flexibly composes these things together. Well, conveniently, the function interface that ships with the JDK has this method called and then. And what and then does is it takes the function on the left-hand side and then gets its result and then calls the function on the right-hand side with the result put in. So we can use this to compose together function pipelines. So we can add the, header to, add the header to our email and then check the spelling and then add the signature. So we get a new function here. This processing pipeline is still just a function, but it's a function from all these three things composed together. Or in our informal case where we don't mind having FTW in the email, we could just compose two things together. So we have this flexibility about the way we, we compose our different pipelines together, and that's another great benefit of function composition. Okay? Cool. So, let's talk a little bit about currying. So, uh, just as an example, very, very simple function uh, that we're going we're gonna to curry and we're going to do lots of things with here is a conversion function. So this is a, like a linear conversion thing, like a kind of y equals mx plus c, right, a straight line. So we've got an amount that we're going to convert, we've got a factor, so that's how steep is the line, and we've got a base, so how high up or down the line it is. So for example, we could convert temperature from 
Celsius to Fahrenheit, from sensible metric to crazy imperial units, uh, with a factor of 1.8 and a base of 32. And we can actually use this conversion function in a variety of different ways. So, as I say, we can convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, we can apply different temperatures in the same factor and base, we can also do currency conversion. So here I'm going to claim the dollar to pound exchange rate 0 0.6. I'm not recommending you use this in your code. I hear rumors that this is how the financial crisis started back in 2008. Um, but yeah, that's a thing we can do. And perhaps something where we have a definitely a more fixed relationship is, current, is uh, distances. So converting between kilometers and miles. Again, uh, a fixed factor and, and zero base again. But it's a bit messy, right, having all this kind of code with these factor and bases lying around all our code base. What we really want to do is have a way of calling a specific function for each of these things whilst reusing the logic. So how do we do this? Well, yeah, sorry. So what's the problem here? Yeah, we really want to have that kind of common thing where we, where we reuse the logic, and we also want to be able to abstract over this function. So we want to re reuse the conversion function in different places, but with specific parameters in there. So how do we do this? Well, we use something called currying. So my favorite type of curry is a tarly. Okay? Quick, hands up, who's, who's a fan of curry around here? Not so many people. Maybe it's a British thing. Maybe it's a British thing. Um, so my favorite type of curry is a tarly, and a tarly is a curry that has lots of different dishes that you can put together however you want. You can eat them in whatever order you want, you can eat part of one and part of the other, whatever you want. And that's a little bit like currying in functional programming. Currying in functional programming is about breaking up one big function that monolithically takes a whole series of arguments and um, generating you a series of functions that eat their arguments one by one. So it takes the first argument, then the second one, and then the third one. So, in Java, there's not a built-in support for currying, but we can write our functions in a curried style and get many of the benefits regardless. So, here we had our amount, factor, and base. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a convert function that takes a factor and a base and returns, as a result, this double unary operator. Again, double unary operator, quite buzzword heavy. But what a double unary operator really is, is a function that takes a double as an argument and returns a double as a result. Unary one argument and double in, double out. And what we've done here is we've returned a function that takes the amount and then applies this conversion function. So up times the amount by the factor and adds the base, just like we did before. And the benefit of this is we have flexibility. So we can call our convert just kept it on this slide so you can see what's going on. We can call our convert with a factor of 1.8 and a base of 32. So we convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit. And then we can call this method that's on the double unary operator called apply as double and pass in our value of, of 10. And um, we'll see the result is 50 because that's, you know, 50 Celsius, sorry, 50, no, no, sorry again. 10 Celsius is 50 Fahrenheit. That's, that's the conversion ratio here. But Im importantly, this is another step. This is what's known as partial application. Now, partial application is the eating of the curry. Okay, eating of the curry function. The ability to pass arguments in one by one into your now curry function to finally get the result. And as a side note, have a look at these guys. They are, not, they are failing at eating their curry really badly, right? For a start, they're drinking wine whilst eating their curry. That's a massive no-no. You always want to have some beer with your curry. And two, they're not enjoying the curry at all. What's going on here? You've got to enjoy a good curry. We've got a few other examples in code of partial application. So as we said before, the Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion we could also apply it for our somewhat questionable pounds to dollars to dollars ratio here. And we can also have a conversion function from kilometers to miles again. So 
Again, we, we, we have this partial application where we've put in some of the arguments, but not all of the arguments, that's why it's partial, and we get a function back as the result, that's our double unary operator. Now, sometimes people might say to you, okay, currying isn't built into Java, that kind of sucks, doesn't it? Well, in some ways it does, but it is possible to write a custom curry function. So, what I've actually done here is write one that works purely on ints. You could write a generic one as well. I just didn't want to have to explain all the generics on one slide because it gets a little bit hairy. But you can definitely write a generic one as well. So the currying one for ints takes an int binary operator, so a function from two integer arguments to begin with that has one integer result, and it returns an int function onto int unary operator. So what does that mean? It's a function that takes one int and returns a function that takes one int and gives you a result. So our first function takes the first argument and returns another function. So we're using lambdas here to return another function and takes a second argument that is passed into the by function where we have those two arguments together. Now we've collected our list of arguments up. We can invoke the function. So we've shown how we can write the custom curry function. It's a little bit more advanced. I'm not saying you should necessarily do this. You can just write it in the current style as we showed earlier, but it is there just to demonstrate that it is still possible in Java to do some of those more advanced functional ideas. And if we wanted to test this out, well, here's just a function that adds two numbers together, and we're gonna curry it, and we do the partial application, put in the first argument, the number one, and the second application, completing the function, the number two, and the result is three, okay? Now, currying gets used in quite a lot of different places. So a classic example, if you look at a lot of functional programs, is they've got something that's a little bit like a factory where they take lots of methods and they build them up one by one. So a bit like you might do with, say, the builder pattern, where you pass in a series of arguments onto your builder and then construct an object at the end. If you've got a function, you can just curry it out and pass in the arguments one by one. Uh, another example where you often see things is parser combinator libraries. So not very big in the Java ecosystem, but very big in the functional programming ecosystem. Combinator libraries are functions that are built up of many little things. So you say, here's a thing that will parse, say, the letter A, and here is a combinator that will take something that parses one thing and let you parse one or more of them and then you partially apply that thing that parses A to the one or more operator, and then you get something that parses one or more A's, and then you can complete it by pu putting in the input that you want to uh, parse. And again, HTML templating libraries, another classic example basically going the other way around. So, quick summary here on currying. Currying is about splitting up the arguments of the function. And partial application, there's often a lot of confusion between these two terms, partial application is about the function eating some of the arguments of this curried function and returning a new function at that point in time. Okay, nice and tasty. So, let's talk a little bit about immutability. Um, and as our kind of running example for this immutability section, we're gonna talk about train journeys. Now, I'm British. So it's a national requirement for me to complain about how bad the train service is in Britain. Um, on the continent, often very good, but you know, this will be a, a, an example motivated by rage. Uh, so our mutable train journey here is a train journey that's got a price and an onward leg. So uh, maybe you wanna go from say, Luxembourg to London via train, you might take the train from Luxembourg to Paris or Luxembourg to Brussels and then take the Eurostar onto London. That's what we invite you here by an onward leg, like a, the next train in the journey. Um, and we've got getters for the price and the onward journey. And what makes this mutable, a mutable train journey, is the fact that we've got setters here that set the price and set the onward journey. So if you want to update this object, we update the object by changing its internal fields, changing its state. Now another approach for modeling our train journey would be an immutable one. So, just going from the top downwards, I've got my train journey immutable class. 
And I have two fields here, the price and the onward journey. We've got the getters, just the same as before. And the key thing here is, instead of having setters, we have with methods. And instead of just returning void, they return a new object. So instead of updating ourselves, we return a new train journey immutable instance. And here we've got the new price and the same onward journey. And here we get an onward journey, so it keeps the same price and a new onward journey there. Okay? Now, you'll note that this, so that, that's our minimum requirement for immutability. What I've also done here is made the fields final. So this, A, discourages other developers from adding mutable setters later on. And it also means that if we're using this object in a concurrent situation, we can guarantee the price and the onward journey will be initialized in the constructor correctly. I've also made the class itself final just to make sure that no one comes along, subclasses my train journey immutable, and adds a mutable method on a subclass somewhere. So just, just uh, for, for, for sanity's sake. So let's think about how we can have a problem that is not, can't exist in our immutable version, but can exist in the mutable version. So here we're going to think about linking together train journeys to form a longer journey. So the first leg and the onward leg. Well, what we've got really here is a data structure that's a bit like a linked list. So we have a start and a continuation journey. And what we do with our destructive, our mutable update, is we take the end leg of the first journey and we make it point to the beginning leg of the next journey. Nice and simple. And we might write our link method like this. So we take our start train journey, our continuation train journey. We'll loop until we find the end of the, of the link list. And uh, when we get there, we will set its onward journey. Okay? So we go through those. Because bear in mind, these journeys might have multiple legs and we want to still link them. So we find the last stop. And then we set the onward journey. We link up the train. So suppose we did that. We linked the first journey to the second one, start to continuation, and then we did the same thing again. So we called link twice, and then we're going to call this visit function that will loop through the journey and just print out the price at every leg and a dash. Well, what we would see is we would see a stack overflow error and a huge, huge stack trace. And what's happened is we tried to link it twice. And the first time we linked it, we got our start and continuation journeys linked up. The second time, it tried to find the end step. And then it linked the end step, which was the end of the second journey, back to the beginning of the second journey. So it created a chain, a loop in, in our chain of journeys. So it was a very, very simple example. All we did was we tried to do the same thing twice, and it completely broke our software here. The mutability was a cause of errors. Now, let's suppose we tried a more functional style of update using the immutable approach. What we're going to do this time around is, in the link function, we're going to take our start journey and our continuation journey, and we're going to create a new journey. Okay, And the start will be the same, but it will point to a different continuation. And for this, we have, again, a very simple immutable approach here. And we could say, is the start null? We'll just return the continuation. Otherwise, we will keep the start's price, return a new journey, and link together the onward component with the continuation. So again, it just loops through the chain until we have them together. And the great point about that is it solves our problem of our infinite list of train journeys. So the bug that happened earlier is physically not possible with this immutable approach, simply due to the immutability. That's great. So there's a lot of related topics to this. Anyone a fan of domain-driven design? No one? One person. Two people. OK. Domain-driven design. Uh, there's a great book, Domain-driven design, and implementing domain-driven design, quite good ideas. Domain-driven design. Uh, has this idea that you have different services in your system and they're decoupled from each other by sending value event classes between them. And those value events are immutable. Okay? There's a lot of move towards immutability in terms of the core Java libraries. 
So Java 8 has a new date and time library, so we don't have to put up with the, the, the chaotic mess that is Java util date. And all the core value types in that proposal, in, in that implementation, are immutable. And there's also a value types proposal, which is meant to be arriving in Java 10, hopefully. And the value types proposal is also immutable. There's a bunch of tooling support for immutability as well. So the final keyword only bans reassignment. It doesn't stop you from having a final field with a mutable value in, so it doesn't guarantee immutability. And there's a couple of projects, such as the mutability detector on GitHub and Maven Central, and FindBugs, and both of these things let you guarantee immutability. So FindBugs takes some asserts and checks them statically. Mutability detector lets you do things like write assert immutable in a unit test and guarantee that class is immutable. But I don't want to come along and claim immutability is a free lunch. It will just fix all your train journey problems and cause no downside. The, one of the downsides of immutability is you tend to allocate to more objects. So you do have a little bit more garbage collection pressure. Potentially a problem, potentially not. Very context sensitive. Some things are very hard to model with immutability. So every time we've got like a big object graph, if you want to change something low down the object graph, you would have to change the whole, you'd have to create a whole new object graph. Could be very, very painful to write as well. A good example of this might be a car simulation. So if you're trying to write a car going around a racetrack and you wanted to have an immutable car, then instead of just saying, move the X and the Y coordinates of the car to the next step in the racetrack, you'd have to give you a new car with a new driver and a new steering wheel and a new engine and a new everything. So immutability doesn't guarantee you clean code, but it, it can be useful. Um, sometimes ORMs don't work very well with immutable classes, and serialization libraries are usually okay. There's usually a trick that you have to do there, but it might require you understand the trick. And the other thing to remember is, there is always this alternative of try and encapsulate state, and even mutable, but localize and encapsulate it effectively, which can sometimes help. So, the takeaway from our section on immutability is even though it's not a panacea, immutable objects can reduce the scope for bugs in your application, and they're definitely a, a thing that's worthwhile considering. And finally, let's talk about the optional data type. So, who's seen this in their application at some point in time? Everyone, fantastic. If you haven't seen a null pointer exception, what have you been doing with your life? So sometimes you get code that looks like this, right? You get a person, and they're getting the name of a car insurance policy. So they pull the car object out of the person, they get the insurance policy out of the car, and they get the name of the insurer. And if you see a null pointer exception on this line of code, where does it come from? The person could have been null, the car could have been null, the insurance policy could have been null. You, you just don't know. Our friend Wally here, once had to debug code like this, and he got so scared that he ran away from his day job as a developer and started hiding in large crowds of people in order to avoid seeing any more null pointer exceptions. That's how that happened. I hear there's a book about it. Another approach is heavy defensive checking. Check the person's not null, the car's not null, the insurance policy's not null, and return a default value if any of them are. So this removes the NPE problem here, but litters your code with defensive checks. It's also not clear what is nullable and what isn't, right? Should that person be null? Maybe that's a valid case that you, the person hasn't logged into your website or something. Maybe it's just a bug elsewhere in your application and you don't want to display no insurance. What's actually going on here? So Java 8 introduces this new type called Java Util Optional. It's a generic type and it's a single value container. So it lets you explicitly model the idea that something could be present or it could be absent and hopefully give you more maintainable code. And the goal here is to reduce the scope for null pointer exceptions or at least reduce values that are null being returned because the idea is you have to unwrap an optional in some case. You've got to try and encourage users to think about the absent case. We'll, we'll return to that in a little bit. 
So what we could do here is explore our moving our domain model to use the optional type. So a person has an optional of car, and the car has an insurance policy called get insurance that returns an optional of insurance. And we're going to say the insurance policy is guaranteed to have a name. So in this case, you'd have to check in your constructor or something that the, the insurer has their own name. But it, that kind of makes sense. You want to enforce that. Whereas, for example, a person may not own a car. I don't own a car. A car may not have an insurance policy. Maybe the person's going the illegal way. Maybe they only use their car on their private racetrack, and they don't need an insurance policy for it. Who knows? So our optional has a bunch of functionality that lets us operate on the value inside it that may or may not be there. So here we've got our map function that takes the insurance and calls its name. And what we can say is, you've got an optional of insurance, and you're going to map over the get name function, and you'll get an optional of string, so the name may or may, may not be present. And the trick here is it preserves safety. So, if you don't have a value in your optional policy, the function won't be called, and you'll just get the empty optional back. And if it is there, it'll call the map, the function passed to map. So, let's try and apply, we've got this map knowledge now, let's try and apply it. So, we'll wrap up our person using the of nullable factory method. So if it's null, it'll be empty. If it's not, it'll be uh, present. We'll try and map the person to the car, the car into the insurance, and the insurance into the name. Now this doesn't quite work, because if we look at that function before, the insurance returns optional of insurance. And we're sorry, the car returns optional of insurance. So we'd have optional of optional of car. It'd be very, very confusing. We'd have a box inside of a box. But thankfully, I can hear in the background, there's a convenient little dog, Shiva Una dog, who's going to tell us what we should try. So flat, such map, much optional, wow. That's right, there's also a flat map defined on optional. So our map took a thing that could return an optional and optional of insurance, and returned us a box within a box, and that was problematic. Our flat map version takes the car and pulls out the, insure, the optional of insurance and just returns that directly. So this lets us deal with methods that may themselves return an optional value without having this box layering effect that we would get otherwise. So we can rewrite our code in a slightly different style. It's maybe a little bit unfamiliar with you. I've heard someone say this is, wow, this is less re readable. I, in some respects, that's just, it's newer. Um, but how, how, have a think about it. So we're going to take our nullable person, we're going to flat map the person to the car, flat map the car into the insurance policy, and map the insurance policy into their name. And then we're going to use the or else method at the end to say, hey, it's unknown. And that would provide a default value. So if at the end we've got an empty box, unknown is the default value we would use in that case, and our method still returns a string. So we've kept all our refactoring local. Now, you might notice here that there's a lot of similarity, so I'm just making the observation that flat map from stream is doing something similar, so it takes a value and takes a function from that value onto a stream of values. Flat map on optional takes a value and returns an optional value. And again, map, one-to-one -one mapping. So you can kind of think of an optional as having this stream-like API, but with only one value. Now, there's a heck of a lot of controversy around the optional data type. Um, some people say it should be used for fields. Some people don't use it for fields at all. And I think there are pros and cons to this approach. You need to think about those pros and cons if you're going to use it in your application and see, does it make sense for you or not? So the pros, it's explicitly modeling the idea that that field may or may not be present. You get null safe access, so you can just guarantee that that field would never be null. You can do code reviews, you can enforce the optional or absent case, and it keeps your getters simple if you're using this. The cons, on the other hand, is a bit of a performance overhead here. There's more indirection and GC overhead for every time you use an optional, because it's got to have this extra uh, object allocation. Not every library understands optional, and some libraries require serializable fields. An optional isn't a serializable type. So people who are using some Java EE containers 
they may require your kind of entity beans to all be serializable, and you'd have to you'd have to write more complicated serialization code. But actually, even though it's a Java 8 title talk, I just thought I'd do a quick breaking news announcement at this point in time that there are some updates to optional in Java 9. Now, optional had a method on it called get that was introduced in Java 8, and the problem with get is it avoided the you're not you're thinking you're not thinking. Uh, start again. The problem with get was it avoided the case where you could unbox it and you were forced to think about it. You could just call get, you get a value back or throw an exception. And this kind of defeated the point of optional, but it was a little bit useful in some cases. So what they've done is they've renamed get to be get when present. And the longer naming is designed to discourage people from using just the get all over the place and defeating the point of optional. They've added an if present or else method uh, and an or method, so alternative features that are quite useful there. And you also have the ability to convert an optional to a stream. The takeaway of this section of the talk is optional, again, is not perfect. You could still have nullable optional fields. There are still some things that can go wrong. But if you're consistent and careful with your use of optional, it can replace the use of null in a really safe, idiomatic, and more effective manner. Let's draw a few conclusions. We talked about four key things here. We talked about how first class functions right at the beginning let us cope with requirement changes. We parameterize by behavior, we can change the behavior. We parameterize by a value, it's harder to change things. We showed how we can reuse core pieces of business logic with Curian. We looked at how immutability reduced the scope for bugs. So instead of having train journeys going all over the place and looping back on themselves. We saw how we could reduce a whole class of bugs, solve a whole class of bugs in one. And then we talked about how we could reduce the scope for NPE problems, null pointers, by uh, having optional data types. But hopefully, there's a bigger takeaway from this talk, and that is that while some of those uh, functional ideas may have come from an academic background, they're things that can be useful for us. They can make our programs more reliable, they can make us more productive, and they can reduce the maintenance overhead. And hopefully, that's where you guys are now, taking a few of those ideas and knowing how to use them. So I'll give you an opportunity to ask some questions in a sec, but before I do that, I'll just note that my colleague Raoul and I have both written books on Java 8, so if you're interested in more information about this topic, uh, they're both great books, have a read, says he. Um, if you're interested in any training courses about Java 8 or other core Java topics, I also run kind of boot camps and master classes for core Java. Uh, you can have a look on iteratorlearning.com or talk to me afterwards about it. Uh, and if anyone here uses Pluralsight, then I'm also a Pluralsight author for a few courses on collections, generics, testing, things like that. Thank you very much. That's the end of the talk. Does anyone have any questions about any of the things that I've talked about? Sorry, can you, can you shout? saying is, is can, I, can, I, can you use the database code or can you use the serialization? So that depends upon the version of that, uh, uh, of, of that technology. So if you're using, say, a Hibernate version for Java 8 release, no, it can't. But um, they have kind of pluggable macro versions like Hibernate, and there's a maven project where you can just go and look at it, box those macros, and I think the newer version of Hibernate should do it anyway. But there's definitely Thank you. Uh, there's definitely a mapper for that kind of thing that will let you plug it in. Hello. Hello. Fantastic. Any other question? Is there a guy at the back there? No. Wave your hand if you have a question. Okay. Well, thank you very much.